In this video, I'm going to talk about the collision of two worlds that has been occurring uh, over, this, over the past, let's say, five years or so, in which very sophisticated software is increasingly becoming available on very, very low-cost computing platforms, mostly driven by the Arduino and Raspberry Pi uh, boards, which predominantly have a market among hobbyists and educators, people wanting to learn how to do hardware development, uh, computer hacking, computer programming, and so on. And in particular, uh, this, this demonstration is coming from one such board. Uh, we're looking at, not in this picture here, uh, but we're looking at, at actually a Raspberry, uh, something that's being uh, produced from a Raspberry board about the size of a deck of cards, or maybe two decks of cards stacked inside the case. And um, it's, a, it's a $35 board maybe about fifty or sixty dollars when you get all the gizmos that you need to make it fire up like a power supply and a memory card and so on um, but basically you you know you just attach a USB keyboard a USB mouse and an HDMI monitor and you're up and running with a self-contained computer for very little money so that's the hardware side of things and I want to introduce two models in particular that are uh, phenomenal the original models were the Model A and the Model B uh, Raspberry, and now we're up to the Raspberry 2 board. In fact, the Raspberry 2 Model B, one gigabyte version, is what uh, this demo is running on. And here's a picture of the board, and it contains a very fast quad-core, well, relatively fast quad-core um, processor in the 900 megahertz that runs 900 megahertz, and you can clock it up to a gigahertz, um, which is not as fast as a uh, it's it's definitely slower than a, a, a Mac or a PC typically would be, but it's much faster than what a netbook uh, would, would supply. So it's somewhere in that kind of middle range. And considering that this whole board costs only $35, again, $50 to $60 with the accessories that you need to really run it, um, that's, that's an incredibly low-cost uh, computer. And I bought mine. I've had it up and running for just a day now. I'm totally excited by what I can do with it. As exciting as that is, <coughs> there's also been in November <coughs> the release of the Raspberry Pi Zero, which is even smaller, about the size of a credit card, and literally costing $5. Now, you can't get them nowadays because scalpers bought up pretty much the entire supply and they're now reselling it for about the price of a Raspberry Pi 2, which is ridiculous. If you're going to spend $35 on a Raspberry Pi, definitely get the Raspberry Pi 2 it's going to be um, much faster, more memory, and also uh, with full-size HDMI and more USB ports. But when the, um, when the $5 price does become available for the Raspberry Pi Zero, this is going to shake things up as well, because everything you're seeing me run now on this uh, Raspberry Pi 2 board would also run just as well, maybe half, half as much memory, only 512 megabytes of memory and a slightly slower processor, but it still run uh, quite well on this much smaller board, which is phenomenal. So what Wolfram has done is they've released uh, their long-term uh, Wolfram language, which is a, uh, a programming language and computing environment that it, I remember being exposed to in 1993, so that's uh, over 20 years ago. <coughs> And it started out as a kind of a text-based, slightly clunky way of doing things. But as, uh, as they expanded more into the graphic realm, um, you could do really interesting things with plots and three-dimensional plots and uh, creating not just pretty pictures, but also a very structured notebook environment, which is what we're going to explore exploring here. What blows me away is that uh, Wolfram has released both of these packages the Wolfram language as well as the Mathematica environment, which would normally cost you anywhere between $250 or so for a home license and $2,000 for a full commercial license of, of Mathematica. It's basically bundled for free with every one of these, uh, every Raspbian operating system that runs on these Raspberry boards. In fact, they're right up here. We have the command line interface right here, and we have the uh, notebook right here. So let's go ahead and take a quick look at the command line interface and we're going to graduate very quickly out of it because there's not a whole lot you can do with it. 
Uh, and incidentally, this video is just being taken by pointing uh, an, I'm, an, an iPad at a, uh, at a monitor screen, very low tech, so there's going to be some artifacts there. <coughs> <coughs> but we can do very simple calculations, like the kind of the standard that we always start with is just 2 plus 2. We type that in, we hit the return key, and we get 4 back. Uh, but we could do, you know, more sophisticated uh, problems. We could uh, do multiplications, divisions, have uh, arbitrary precision real numbers, and it would come back and give us answers very, very quickly. Or you can do things like uh, compute pi, let's say, to a thousand digits if you wanted to. Uh, there's the first thousand digits of pi in basically an instant. Where you run into problems, though, is if you're trying to create plots of functions. Let's uh, create a plot of a trigonometric function. <clears throat> We're going to plot cosine of x with x ranging from minus 2 pi to 2 pi and see what that looks like in this environment. And it just comes back and says, well, there's graphics associated with that, <clears throat> but I can't show you what that graphics is. So right, right now, <coughs> we've um, we've kind of run into the limit of uh, graphically what this can do. But it can it can do things, uh, for example, it can solve algebraic equations, uh, not to dismiss it. I could say um, solve for 2x minus 17 equals 25, what's the value of x? And it will come up and say x, uh, x would be 21 to satisfy that um, uh, that problem. Actually, you know what I meant to say was 2x, the reason it came up so big is I meant to say 2x plus 17. There, x is just 4. So you plug 4 in for x and 2x plus 17 is equal to 25. We don't have to stop there. We could do um, uh, either uh, 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 full-blown uh, integral of differential calculus. We could do for example, integrate, oh, I don't know, uh, cosine of x with respect to x. That's a very simple problem. Comes back with sine of x. You could put in a polynomial instead. Uh, 2x, let's put in that uh, expression we had before, 2x minus 17 with respect to x. Actually, plus 17 <laughs> with respect to x. And we get another pro uh, polynomial back. 17x plus x squared. Um, and you can see how it's kind of shoehorning the results into what the text the text can deliver. There's a full programming environment based on the list that this runs on. I'm not going to delve into that. Um, let's just dump the command line interface and switch to the notebook view. What's nice about the notebook view is everything we've seen so far in terms of the language, the execution capabilities is present in the notebook. The notebook, though, is um, also a full word processor environment, image processing. Uh, you can, it's a layout package. You can have plots mixed with, with sounds, mixed with images, mixed with text, mixed with uh, dynamic um, code that can be run. And again, all of this is running completely for free as a result of purchasing this very low-cost board. So. Um, I could just start typing exactly what we did before, you know, 2 plus 2 or something like that. I should mention that for purposes of video, I'm going to blow up the text quite a bit so that we can see it uh, by 300%. Um, but this is not really doing justice to what the notebook interface is all about. So I'm going to delete that cell, and instead I'm going to start uh, formatting as though I were writing kind of like a scientific paper or a mathematical paper. I'd want to insert a title, for example. And this is kind of like an outline way of uh, creating a document. Um, I'm having trouble with my mouse, unfortunately. Um, so the uh, the title might just be um, Intro to Mathematica. Again, this is too big, so I'm going to take it down to 200%. Introduction to Mathematica. And... Uh, Maybe I'd like to put in uh, my name, so I might put that in as a subtitle, style, subtitle, and uh, by Bert Sierra, or I should say 
pipeline man. No, I'm not sure why it's not taking this text. Here we go. Pipeline man Bert Sierra, December 8th, 2015. Okay. So let's uh, do what we were doing before. We started with some numeric examples. So uh, <clears throat> we might start a section. And Alt-4 would be the keyboard way of getting into a section, but I'm not going to use the keyboard equivalents because it's a little harder to see what's going on. Um, we might just say um, arithmetic. Arith ar ar arithmetic examples. So we can put in the same things we did before. 2 plus 2, that comes back as 4. We can put in some, you know, fairly sophisticated equations here. 2,347 to the 12th power. Now notice how I kind of did it the textual way to say 2,347 to the 12th, but there are also these things called palettes where we have math assistants and we can enter uh, anything from powers or square roots, fractions, uh, the value pi, for example, we can enter that in graphically instead of typing pi. Um, and it gets even more advanced than that because we have things like products and integrals, summations, and so on. We'll actually see what a couple of those might look like. So 2347 to the twelfth power, let's say, uh, minus uh, now I need to do a right arrow to get out of the exponent, minus 7 point, I don't know, some big number. It computes that. We can do the same thing as we did before, computing pi, but this time I'm going to press in the math assistant to get the symbolic version of pi out to a thousand digits. Same thing, same number is going to be returned, 3.141, and a whole bunch of digits. Um, <clears throat> so those are all arithmetic examples. Let's do a couple of examples from um, algebra. So here I'm going to insert a new section. Style. Section. Algebraic. Examples. So for example, we could do <coughs> the same thing we did before, where we solved for <coughs> 2x plus 17 equals 25. What is x? X must be 4. Um, we can do something where we saw we do a summation. So, for example, you may have learned that there's a formula for the first n, n integers, like the sum of all the integers from 1 to some number n, where n could be 20 or 100 or 1,000 or whatever you want. There's a formula for that, n times n plus 1 over 2. And we can actually have um, Wolfram Alpha derive that for us using a summation. So we can say, th there is the old way of doing it. Let me put that in uh, first. You could just say sum i, where i goes from 1 to n. And that would be enough for it to, come to find the answer. 1 half n times 1 plus n. That's the same as <coughs> n times n plus 1 over 2. <coughs> That's kind of the old way of doing it. Uh, the kind of the command line way. The new way is to kind of do it in a more graphic fashion where you can say, as I said, we pulled up this, the, the template for a summation from the advanced tab of the basic math assistant right here. There's summation products, uh, indefinite integrals and definite integrals. You can also do matrices and so on. Um, so this is putting in basically slots that we're going to put things in. So we're going to type I for the index and then tab to get into the starting value. Starting value is 1. We have a, an indefinite ending val value because we don't have a fixed number we're going to. It's going to be to whatever n is. And we're just adding up the values of i. So we hit, uh, we hit uh, enter on that and we get the same exact answer. But what's really cool is, is you could do this for arbitrary uh, polynomials. You could say what's the sum of uh, 4i plus i squared minus 7 and it'll compute that and come up with the, the polynomial there. And similarly we could just plug that in here. So 4i 
plus i squared. Here I'm going to use the fancier way of doing the square. Squared uh, minus 7. And this should come up with the same exact answer. And it doesn't because 4i plus i... Oh, uh, I suspect it's because we need a parenthesis in there to group all of that inside the summation. <coughs> there we go. Now we have the same answer. <coughs> <coughs> so, um, so yeah, there's some uh, algebraic examples, and uh, we can go from there. We can do calculus examples. Uh, let's put in the, uh, the calculus thing we did before. Um, we'll put in another uh, section. We'll say calculus examples. And these are just very uh, simple things. You can we, the thing we put in before, I believe, was integrate. Uh, cosine x with respect to x that comes back as a sine of x uh, there's a graphic way of doing that you would just simply say what's the indefinite integral of cosine of x with respect to x that will come back with the same thing uh, these could be polynomials instead so we could for example say take that polynomial plug it in there oops I'm using Mac equivalents for copy and paste. That probably won't work. Uh, yeah, Control C. So I'm going to copy this and I'm going to paste it in here. And then this needs to become an I. So here's the integral there. And we can do the same thing down here where we take that, paste in the polynomial, put in di. Uh, yeah, I think it's the same thing here, where we need parentheses, and then we'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so you can see how, uh, it, what's amazing to me is as a long-time Mathematica user is to see this running essentially for free on a low-cost low board. Um, I've had versions of Mathematica going back to Mathematica 3 and uh, it's very exciting to see what's now possible in Mathematica uh, 10 uh, now in 2015 and uh, including what you can do with uh, plots and graphics and I'm just gonna skim the very uh, top of top of what can be done um, here in another section, we're going to say graphics examples. And um, you can make not just plots, you can, uh, it's hard to explain the depth. There's a full graphics environment that's fully programmable, so the, the objects that, that result can, can be uh, poly, uh, polygons or three-dimensional objects. Uh, related in very, very complex ways with lines between them or not between them. I mean, you really have a very sophisticated graphics underpinning. The simplest thing I can do in a very short uh, demo version is just to do the same plots as we did before. So, for example, here's a two-dimensional plot of the cosine of x with uh, x ranging from, let's say, minus 2. And here I'm going to I could go up into the basic math assistant and plug in this pi here, but there's also a keyboard way of entering this. You can say escape pi, and that gets that <clears throat> special uh, object in there. I need to say x here. x ranging from minus 2 pi to 2 escape pi. And there we see that plot. And if we want to make it a little bit more interesting, maybe we'll multiply by um, x here so it's x times cosine of x, so the uh, the plot kind of wiggles a little bit around zero. Um, but it gets really much more interesting. Let's say we take that <clears throat> in this direction and let's say multiply it by a different uh, trigonometric function to make a three-dimensional plot. We could say, well, let's take that, x times cosine of x in the x direction, and modulate that by a sine let's say, which is dependent on uh, things going on in the x and y direction, and see what that looks like over a similar uh, 
similar range of values. So we're going to go from <coughs> x being minus, pi, uh, minus 2 pi to 2 pi. And y ranging from minus 2 pi to 2 pi. So what's really cool about this, and this is the one thing you're going to see in which you really notice that you're not on a laptop or a desktop, uh, because as fast as as fast as it produced this uh, this answer, uh, we can also spin this answer. We can also look at this in three dimensions and just kind of marvel at uh, the structure that's there. In fact, if we align it, I'm not going to try and align it to that to that way. If we align it just right, we'll actually see a hint of the same. Uh, x cosine x function. It would have to be aligned just like so. And you'll see how this is kind of reminiscent of this curve here, although I flipped it backwards. It would have to be 180 degrees around to get the idea. So if, if we flip at it, if we flip at it from this angle, <coughs> and here the speed is actually getting in the way a little bit. <coughs> If we flip at it in this, di this direction, looking at it in the same axis, or maybe it's... I have to think about it. There it is. That's the axis I'm thinking of. Here's kind of the reminiscence of that curve here. Nope, now it's flipped around again. <coughs> I think I flipped it too far. In, in, in any case, you get the idea. You can kind of see, see this. Not only that, you can take it even further and say, what happens if we... Uh, put in a parameter. So, for example, we want to manipulate a, a scaling parameter. Manipulate um, this plot where this new value a can range from, let's say, minus 5 to plus 5. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to scale this whole thing by a and we'll maybe also have it control a frequency in here, or maybe actually right here. So now we have a, a completely different function. I can take out those, uh, if spaces make it easier to see the multiplication, we can say ax cosine x times sine of, and you can take out that times as well, <coughs> sine of ax plus y. There has to be a space in here to make a and x be different values. So what happens here is you actually get a plot which can be, and now it's going to be really slow um, because it's rendering uh, this. We can actually see what happens when we um, when we change the value of a. So we can see as a goes to zero, it kind of smooths out a little bit. If I let go, uh, that will do the full rendering. See how. Uh, as you move this, it's kind of doing very quick, but very inaccurate plots. And then once you let go, there's a more accurate rendering that will take place and give you a more accurate idea of what the function looks like. So this is something where, because the speed of the Raspberry Pi is lower than a laptop, you're not seeing it at its full um, at its full glory. But the great thing is this is free. This uh, program is completely free on a very low cost environment. And even better, I'm going to show you at the end of this demo how you can create these demonstrations for free and people can run them on Macs and Windows systems without even purchasing um, Mathematica. I'm not going to show you anything illegal, I'm just going to show you the power and the flexibility of what Mathematica can do. So, um, we're going to actually tackle one, a real, a real life problem. And that's what I'm going to kind of finish my notebook up with. So we're going to insert another section here called let's do some shape algebra. Let's do some shape algebra. Now what shape algebra is, is I've noticed on the internet <clears throat> there's all kinds of silly uh, internet problems running around and one of them, and I've collected a few of these on my blog Science vs. Universe on Facebook, um, one of them are these kinds of problems where you're presented with Sometimes they'll be 
fruit. They'll be like bananas and apples and oranges, and you're asked to figure out what the value, what, what the banana would have to be to make some series of equations work. Ultimately, it's just algebra. It's just being stated in a kind of a weird, internet-y way. And whenever you see this, because it's being stated in a weird way, you also you always have to be a little bit of a mathematical skeptic and say, well, maybe there's some things being left out that a mathematician would say to kind of flesh out in a more logical fashion what what is being looked for. So, for example, we might have to say, point out that the dots here represent multiplication, the addition here represents addition. There's one, one thing that'll trip people up is there's oftentimes, if, if somebody sees something like A plus B times C, they'll do the addition and ahead of the multiplication. No, you need to do the multiplication first, uh, according to the standard rules of what's known as PEMDAS, where there's, a, there's an order to which operators are, are, have precedence. Uh, but basically, we need to figure out what can go in the square uh, uh, slots here so that <clears throat> whatever we put in there, the result is 27. Once we have that, we can figure out this next line, what we have to put in there so that with that previous answer we have 24. Now we have those two things. We're introducing a circle thing. comes up to 96. We take the circle and we add it to the product of the square times the triangle. And what's the answer? What's that thing going to be? Um, why don't you pause the video and see if you can solve this, but we're actually going to now build this into Mathematica. And incidentally, if it's not clear, the equivalent set of algebraic expressions would be this. S cubed square, square multiplied by itself three times is 27. T cubed times S is 24. S times T times C squared is 96. Take C, add that to S times t, and that must be equal to x. We're interested in x, what x is predominantly, but we'd also kind of like to know what all of the values of s and t and c have to be uh, for the value of x get. <clears throat> so take a moment, see if you can figure that out, and then I'll show you how we can kind of solve that in Mathematica. A real problem. First thing we'd like to do is take advantage of Mathematica's graphic environment, we kind of like to steal this graphic and put it into Mathematica. So I'm going to hide Mathematica for a moment, and we're just going to grab out of the web browser, we're going to grab this graphic. So I'm going to say open link in new tab, and that tab is open, but I think, but hidden. Yeah, here it is. Uh, the, what I'd like to do is just drag this image onto the desktop, but I don't think that works. Yeah, that doesn't work. And likewise, if I right-click on it, there's no save image thing here. So the first thing I need to do is just open the image into a new tab, simply so I can get access to the image itself. Now, I can either uh, drag this. Yep, that worked. Or I could have right-clicked on it and say, Save Image As. Same thing. I'm going to end up with a PNG file here on the desktop. And I'm, I'm going to uh, rename this. Oh dear, this is actually, no, this is actually a link. Yeah, let's get rid of that. What will work is Save Image As. I'm not really familiar with this web browser. And we're going to call this uh, Shape Algebra problem one, let's call it, and .png, and we're going to get rid of all this gobbledygook related to where it came from. Uh, we're going to save that to the desktop, and boom, there's our file. Here it is, open, opened up in the picked viewer. So we've got that image. Now we can steal it and put it into our um, into our Mathematica document. So we can go up here and say insert picture from file. And you just have to use this to learn all the all the different things that you can do. We're going to insert it in there and it's probably going to come up too big. Sure enough, because we've blown this document up to 200%. 
So we can grab any corner of the image, select the image, and then grab any corner and just drag it, and that will make it smaller. So there's our graphic. Now we'd like to add some text and explain that this can be expressed algebraically this way, and we're going to enter these equations in. So let's just insert some plain text. Text is not executable. It's not actually a formula. It's just plain old text. And I'm going to make this a bit bigger so we can see it on the screen. I'm going to make it 24 point. So I'm going to say here is how we express the algebraic equations in Mathematica. Text. So that uh, that means that we're not actually going to execute these as, as statements, like using the Wolfram language. We're just going to express the text. So we want to insert another block of text. This time I'm going to make this text centered. Oh, my mouse is a little too fast to hit these menus. So insert text, make it 24 point. You can change the defaults for the styles. I'm just blowing things up for the video. Um, and we're going to also uh, align the text so that it's centered. So here's how we enter the first one. We say s cubed equals 27. And the geeky way of doing it would be this. You would say s caret 3. And then here we need to use double equals, uh, which are different than setting a variable to, to be equal to something. Um, but because it's text, we don't really care. We're not going to execute this, so we don't really need that to deal with that semantic distinction between setting a variable and equality. So we can just say s cubed equals 27. And here we'd really like to make that 3 be a superscript. So once again, like we did for equations, we can put in the superscript 3. So there's our first equation, s cubed equals 27. Similarly, we want to say t cubed and here we can say superscript. There's a way of doing this using um, just typing. You don't need to go to the math assistant. But I tend to find the math assistant uh, a little bit easier to remember. So t cubed times s equals 24. s times t times c squared. And I'm doing a right, a right arrow here to get out of the exponent equals 96, and finally c plus s times t equals x. And you, and you notice I'm being lax here. I'm not putting in explicit dots or asterisks just because they don't look as good as just this, I think. So there's our kind of typeset uh, way of expressing the algebra. And now we're going to actually put in the equation. Here's how we actually solve it using mathematic input. So I'm going to put in first uh, text saying what we're going to do. And I need to make that 24 point as well. So here we're going to say um, <clears throat> here is how we solve this problem in using Mathematica uh, language input. Okay, now this is going to be a little bit different because we're not putting in static text that can't be executed. We're going to actually execute this. That's actually the default style for anything we input. It is coming in by default in input format. So we can just we can just put in a solve. Um, and I'm going to make this bigger so we can see it on the video. Solve. Uh, Mathematica functions typically take arguments which are uh, enclosed in square brackets. So you can see when I put in a pair of square brackets, Mathematica right now is complaining because I haven't said what's inside yet. Uh, we're going to give it two things. We're going to give it a list of equations and a list of variables. Both lists need to be in braces. Lists is a, is a concept that you, when you learn the language, <clears throat> you learn what lists are all about. So the first list we have to put in is the list of equations. And we can literally type exactly as we did before. We could put it in the geeky way like this. Okay? Or we could use the fancier way of saying s 
and then use the basic math assistant to put in those exponents right arrow to get out of the exponent s cubed equals 27 and here because we're actually going to execute this it's actually very important that we don't say equal here because that will attempt to set this into this uh, expression here and we can't do that because this is an expression and not just a variable we have to put in equalities which means the double equal sign so that's kind of an important thing we need to remember we put in a comma and then we say t cubed s right arrow to get out of the exponent t cubed s equals 24 s now I can't just type STC here because um, <clears throat> Mathematica would allow for uh, variables with more than one name. Like if I typed omega, that's not O times M times E times G times A. That's actually the single variable omega. So similarly here, STC would be a single variable. I actually have to intersperse either multiplication signs or as I prefer, just a space will do it. So S space T space C is, represents multiplication and then we raise the C to the second power that must be equal to 96 and finally C plus S space T to represent multiplication equals X and lastly so that's our list of equations and lastly we uh, want to list all of the variables we're solving for. So we want to find out what S has to be, T has to be, C has to be, and X has to be. Okay? Now, I deliberately put in a syntax error, and it's actually the syntax error that I accidentally led with, because I want you to see uh, how syntax actually plays an important role in this language. When we hit enter here, we get exactly the same errors we got when the video began, um, namely I've got a problem in my expression. I want to make the error message bigger so we can see it on the video. So I'm bumping that up to 24 point as well. So you see right here in this expression there's a problem because I'm using a set as opposed to an equality in the C plus ST Thing. This is protected, so I can't write x into this expression. This needs to be an equal sign. Similarly, one level out, it's also complaining that because of that being a set, this isn't a list of equalities. It has to be a list of equalities, a quantified system of equations and, and inequalities. Um, so I really need to fix this up by putting in the double equal sign, and then it'll, it'll run just fine. When I do that, it comes up with, oh, lo and behold, x can be 10, but it can also be 2. And I bet you nobody, almost no one watching this video will have spotted that. And I love this problem for that, because we're so trained to skip the observation here that c could be either uh, plus 4 when s is 3 and t is 2. It can be plus 4, but it could also be minus 4, because the c squared destroys the sign. It could be either plus 4 or minus 4 for it to come out in 96. And most people, even people familiar with algebra, uh, skip that skip that observation because we're taught to think in terms of there being only one possible solution. And what's great about math and the beauty of math is that it's a form of logic and you really have to consider all the possibilities. And speaking of all the possibilities, at no point did we ever say that the values have to be integer or real valued. So it turns out that if you really want to get technical about it, there are actually not, there's actually not one way of solving for s cubed is 27. There's actually three ways. We can find them by similarly putting in a solve here, making it bigger so we can see it. We can put in a solve here that says, well, what is s cubed What's the solution for s cubed cubed equals 27, solving for s? And it turns out when we do that, Mathematica gives us the answer we expect, namely s is 3. But 
if you actually consider there to be uh, complex valued results, um, which result from a mathematical extension to regular numbers where you consider there to be actually a square root of negative one, then there are actually three possible answers. And indeed, that's just if we choose complex numbers. We can choose even more complex numbers, quaternions or other systems of numbers, in which there may be even more solutions to this. So once there are three solutions to this thing, you then have to consider that, wow, there's going to be more than three solutions to this next thing. So in total, uh, when you get back down to the, to the final answer, there's actually quite a number of complex solutions. I'm not going to count exactly how many there are, but there's a bunch of them. Um, and that comes about because of all the different combinations that can result. Three combinations from here, that many more combinations resulting from this, and then final in the final constraint, there's, uh, there's even more combinations. But we can, we can simplify. We don't need to consider those. If we want to just consider the real solutions, we can put in a third argument to our solves, which says reals. And because the answer is an integer, we could also just say, you know what, I'm only interested in integers. So we can actually simplify our answer down here as well, so that instead of looking at all the complex problems, we can limit it to just reals or just integers, which I'm going to do here. And when we do that, we see that there are only two solutions. Either the answer is 10, in which case the square is 3, the triangle is 2, and the circle is 4, or the case where the value is 2, which would mean flipping the sign of c to being minus 4. And those are the only two possible solutions over all of the integers and all of the real numbers. So now that we've kind of finished that demo, um, I'm going to show you kind of the cool, cool things you can now do with this notebook. We now actually have a pretty decent sized notebook. And on the Science versus Universe uh, blog, I'm going to post the source for this. Because if you have a Raspberry Pi, you can download this. Uh, you'll be able to download this document plus the variants of this document that I'm going to create um, and play with it. Um, so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to save it into the native Mathematica format. So it's called a Wolfram Notebook. And you need to have a... Uh, a licensed copy of Mathematica, either the free version that comes with the Raspberry Pi Raspbian operating system, the home edition that I run on my Mac, uh, you can also get the home edition for PCs, or the commercial government or um, uh, educational uh, licensed versions of the full product, which could cost you up to $2,000. It's not cheap. And we're going to call this uh, Intro to Mathematica dot nb for notebook. Um, we're also going to create a flat PDF version. So since very few people will be able to run Mathematica, we might also want to create a more portable version um, of this document. So we're going to create in the save as, we have an option here for the type of the file. We can say PDF. So we're going to create that as well. And um, let's just kind of drop out of Mathematica for a moment after it's finished creating that PDF. And uh, let's drop out of Mathematica for a moment and also hide the web browser and take a look at that PDF. Uh, first time you double click on a PDF, it won't know how to deal with it. You need to uh, set the PDF reader probably is the most uh, PDF viewer, it's one of the uh, accessories. PDF viewer, you want to make that the default type. You can also do it in as saying open with, and then in here say it's an accessory, it's PDF viewer. I want to always open up PDFs with PDF viewer. So here's the PDF we created, and sure enough, we see two things happen. We have all of the cells that we were looking at before, and I can use my down uh, my scroll wheel to get at the subsequent pages, but we've lost something. We've lost, for example, the interactivity in being able to spin the 3D shapes, uh, in, able, in being able to change this wheel here. We've also lo uh, lost some of the structural ability in Mathematica to, for example, you can collapse whole sections and grow them. And so we'd like to have 
a version of this document which is portable, but at the same time preserves some of that interactivity. And there's actually a wonderful technology that I want to introduce you to in this increasingly lengthy demo in which we look at uh, this, this interim format known as computable document format. Uh, and you'll find it on the Wolfram, out, uh, the Wolfram website. If you go to wolfram.com, you'll see there's a Technologies tab here, and you can uh, click on Computable Document Format. Mac and Windows users, there's no Linux version um, as of yet, but uh, Mac and Windows versions can download CDF Player version 10.3, I believe, right now. Um, if you go to Download CDF Player, you'll see you just need to identify yourself, um, choose uh, how you're basically going to be using CDF Player. It's going to be free no matter what. Um, and put in your email address and you'll be able to start to download. It's a pretty big download, about a half a gigabyte for the Mac version and I believe a little bit more for the Windows version. Um, but once you've installed CDF Player on your system, you'll get an application which I can't show you on. It doesn't run on Linux, so I can't show it to you. But basically what you'll be able to do is run that interactive version of the notebook, and you'll have the same... You won't be able to change any of the cells. You won't be able to recompute anything. But you'll have the same kind of cell and section-oriented way of browsing the document. And also, more importantly, when you get to these um, manipulable things, like, for instance, this... Uh, this th 3D graphic here, which is actually running at a pretty good speed here, you'll be able to not, a not only change the viewpoint of the graphic, you'll be able to change this parameter. And there could be multiple parameters. This could be a, the result of a very complex Lisp program uh, that's being computed. So Wolfram is actually a very, very sophisticated environment, and it absolutely blows me away that this is being offered for the price of zero. It's basically being bundled for free into every copy of Raspbian, the Raspbian operating system. That just blows me away. So here's how we create a CDF. We simply take either all or some of our uh, of our document uh, and we say save as and now we simply uh, there's a little bit more to this when you're creating a real comp computable document, but this is the basic version. You say save as, you say make it a CDF, it's going to come up with the CDF type. And now, uh, if we were to open that back up in Wolfram Alpha, we won't really see what it looks like under CDF player because Wolfram Alpha would, uh, would uh, will allow, sorry, uh, Mathematica would allow us to edit and change any of the expressions. But uh, I'm going to create a zip file. In fact, I'm going to do it right now. Let's put all of these things together into a folder called um, Intro to Mathematica on Raspberry Pi, or just Intro to Mathematica. And I'm going to put everything except the image in there because it's copyrighted. Yes, yeah, so we're going to move the image to the trash, move these things into the folder, and now create an archive out of that folder. Intro to Mathematica. I'm going to save that to the desktop. Oops. Yeah, I'm not sure how to use compress. Compress. Create a new archive. Yeah, we want that on the desktop. And let's make it a zip file and not a... <clears throat> oh, we can't. So it's going to be a... Oh, I think... B yeah, BZ2 is fine. And Oh, I guess I don't know how to... <laughs> I guess I don't know how to create zip files on the Raspberry yet. <coughs> in any case, there will be a... Um, there will be a zip version of this in the Science vs. Universe uh, blog uh, accompanying this video. 
and uh, you can grab these uh, these files that we just created in this demo and play with them on your own, expand them, change them, uh, play around with them however you want. So I hope the point of this is to show just how powerful that collision is when you get really sophisticated software running on a really, really cheap environment. It absolutely blows me away uh, that you can get for under $50 a system that is running software this good, this sophisticated, and have it up and running in an afternoon. And that's everything. I hope you enjoyed this demo.